Welcome to The Real News Network. I am David Kattenberg. It is a, a staggering statistic. This past May, U.S. officials announced that COVID has killed a million Americans. The number is likely higher. Globally, over 6 million have died since the pandemic began in January 2020. Meanwhile, a, a potentially deadlier pandemic is sweeping the planet. Bacterial infections, untreatable with antibiotics. According to a recent report in the medical journal The Lancet, in 2019, drug resistance bacterial infections were linked to 5 million deaths worldwide. One and a quarter million deaths were directly attributable to drug resistance bacterial infections. According to a UK government study, by 2050, antimicrobial resistance, or AMR, could kill 10 million people annually. As with COVID, drug resistance bacterial infections are not equitable. The most marginalized are the hardest hit in North America and globally. Joining me to talk about the drug resistance crisis, two experts in the field, Shira Daron is an associate professor of medicine at Tufts University in Boston and the director of the Antimicrobial Stewardship Program at Tufts Medical Center. In 2021, Dr. Daron co-authored a letter to the journal Nature Medicine entitled Antibiotic Resistance, a Call to Action to Prevent the Next Epidemic of Inequality. Shira Daron joins us from Boston Tomislav Mestrovich is a medical doctor and clinical microbiologist and an associate professor at University North in Croatia. He's also a scholar at the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington. He's worked closely with the authors of that Lancet study on the global burden of drug-resistant infection. Tomislav Mestrovich joins us from Seattle, Washington. H hello to the two of you. It's good to have you. I'd like to ask you to start off. Is the drug resistance crisis receiving the, the media attention uh, it, it deserves? And, and is, it, is it a crisis? Is it a global crisis? Um, she, Shira Daron, why don't you start? Yeah, it is a crisis. And uh, it isn't a, uh, receiving the attention it deserves. You know, people like me who work in the hospital and take care of patients with complicated infections, we see it every single day. And increasingly, we see patients who have infections for which we have no antibiotics. We have nothing in the arsenal. Uh, and yet it isn't in the media. And why is that? Um, maybe because it isn't novel. Maybe because it's been happening very gradually and worsening over time. And therefore, it doesn't get the same kind of attention as something like COVID-19, a novel uh, a virus, obviously, that um, can affect everybody. And maybe it's because people don't feel like it touches them, but it will ultimately touch uh, people in all walks of life eventually. And that's uh, why these calls to action are so important. And it's amazing, like 100, 160,000 deaths in the United States, States each year attributed to or directly linked to antibiotic resistant infections, 160,000 deaths each year. Yeah, and, and we feel that. And, and that to me, that's not a surprising number, um, given what I see uh, every day. Um, you know, I, I wonder if people think there will always be another antibiotic developed by pharmaceutical companies, but I, I don't think we can count on that. I know we can't. Thomas Lof Mestrovich, your thoughts on this? Yeah, uh, I completely agree with what Shira has said, and AMR is definitely one of the biggest threats of this century and also poses the threat not only to human health, but also to animal health, to food, to our environmental security, and of course, global economy also. But the news media coverage and how the AMR is conveyed or framed in the media can then powerfully shape public perception of AMR risk. But as Shira said, in many countries, news coverage on this issue is very sparse and Articles commonly represent AMR as a social problem that it's mainly caused by, for example, dirty hospitals or 
by some others who misuse or overuse antibiotics, but the role of many important social actors is neglected. The role of uh, social determinants of health that have a role in AMR are marginalized. And a lot of media coverage revolves around new scientific discoveries related to AMR and AMR solutions. But as Shira mentioned, this is scarce. New antibiotic won't be always available. And uh, this sometimes put individuals in the position of ignorance. And then they lack agency for the AMR agenda. And maybe sometimes how the stories are covered may even undermine the public's motivation for taking collective action to, take, to tackle AMR. And maybe sometimes even uh, uh, can trigger like feelings of helplessness, paralyzing individual actions. So this is something that, that we have to take into account, especially now when we know the, the, the full uh, scope of this problem and, and of this issue. Uh, we have to work on the, on, the, on the public understanding of AMR and exactly what drives it. Forward. And how, how are how is AMR covered in the media in your in your view, Tomislav? That's that is misleading or not helpful. Yeah, so media attention mainly fluctuates around either official reports or scientific discoveries, uh, but seldom around, for example, reports of inappropriate antimicrobial use. And uh, for example, despite a growing research interest in the epidemiology of AMR in low- and middle-income countries, the limited research in media representation of AMR risk in these countries, maybe, for example, due to a general overlook of the importance of media context in shaping public perception, policies, and stakeholder engagement in these countries regarding the AMR. And this, uh, this is a problem that we need to be, to be mindful of. Shira Darone and and and, and Tomislav, what drives antimicrobial resistance? So we're talking about bacteria that are out there; they're common, uh, common species, common strains. But uh, the emergence of of strains that are resistant to uh, some or numerous or even all antibiotics we call these superbugs. Um, what what drives the the proliferation of antibiotic resistance? What makes it happen, Shira? Well, mainly it's antibiotic use, antibacterial drug use. And I, I like to say it isn't overuse of antibiotics that cause resistance. It's use of antibiotics that causes resistance. And some of it we have to do. Some of it is absolutely necessary. So we better not do the antibiotic use that isn't necessary. Um, and so that antibiotic use is happening in the healthcare settings, um, antibi actual antibiotic prescriptions. It's happening when people take unprescribed antibiotics. It's happening when people give antibiotics to animals, both agricultural and companion animals. And then it's happening in the environment, runoff from uh, farms where antibiotics have been used, or even just in, to a small extent, um, people dumping unused antibiotics into landfills, et cetera. And then there's a little bit of use in actually in, in plant agriculture as well. So there are just so many places right now where we're essentially pumping antibiotics into our environment, changing human and animal microflora under that evolutionary pressure. Um, and that's only going to get worse over time. Because when you when you expose bacteria to antibiotics, you know the, the the ones that the ones that don't die proliferate. What doesn't, you know, kills them, make them stronger. Some of them they just nat naturally develop mutations that make them resistant. Where use of antibiotics is selecting for resistant strains, isn't it? That's evolution one hundred and one. The, the bacteria are going to try to survive, and they will mutate accordingly. And so let's let's t take this ap apart a little bit. Like you're talking about misuse of antibiotics, break this down a little bit for us. Uh, like Tomislav, like using antibiotics to treat viral infections, or you know, broad spectrum versus narrow spectrum, and all this is basics. Yeah, really important points that Shira has covered. Run and, through this. Yeah, and when we talk about misuse. Uh, or overuse sometimes of antibiotics in humans that pertains to, for example, not finishing a course of antibiotics, and like you mentioned, taking antibiotics for viral rather for uh, bacterial infections. Uh, 
And then uh, also... Viruses, viruses are impervious to antibiotics. Yeah, it's completely different. So bacteria are prokaryotic cells that uh, we can uh, use some of their structures uh, to target with our antibiotics that viruses just don't have. Viruses have to enter human cells to reproduce. So this is a completely different organisms. And this is why uh, antibiotics won't work for, for viral infections. But also, Shira covered some other important points of general use of antibiotics. For example, we sometimes even... Uh, in, in whole states and countries have mass drug administrations, which means regular provision of antibiotics to a large group of people to treat an infection, regardless of whether individuals are ill or not. This is one also of important drivers of resistance. Run, but, run past this, go through this for me. What happens? Just mass provision? So, of yeah, so sometimes you have uh, like uh, uh, public health programs that are based on mass provision of antibiotics to uh, in a way, uh, you try to prevent certain infections. People may not even be ill, but they receive antibiotics. So this is also something that can be considered as one of the potential drivers of, an, uh, of antimicrobial resistance. And here we see it's antimicrobial use, like Shira has mentioned, not misuse or, 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 or overuse, but just use in a preventive sense. But then you can end up with antimicrobial resistance problem as well. So these are some important points that need to be considered when we talk about using antibiotics. But if we look at the drivers of AMR, it's not just antibiotics. For example, sometimes we lack quick, accurate tests to diagnose infections, which can then uh, uh, have a propensity to, to further foster the spread of AMR and resistant microorganisms. We don't have enough effective vaccines, or even the ones we do have, there is a poor uptake of, of those. Of course, human travel. Today we live in a globalized world and when people travel from one area of the globe to another, they can spread these resistant microorganisms. So they are spread in the community, not only in the healthcare system. These are all, I think, important drivers of AMR on top of the overuse or misuse or just use of antibiotics. Shira, talk a bit about the the, the problem of the, the prevalence of antibiotic resistant infections in hospitals. You know, the problem is that it, it is so prevalent that we see a patient with an infection and we must cover them with antibiotics, what we call empirically, before we know what the organism is. Um, cultures, unlike other lab tests, have to cook. They, have, they take time to grow. And only once you grow them, uh, can you then test them for what genus and species of bacteria do you have? And then what is it, what antibiotics will work against it? It can take usually about three days to get that answer. In that time, you need to give them something. When you have seen over and over again that the bacteria that your patients have been growing are resistant, you are very much inclined to give them the broadest spectrum antibiotic possible so you don't get caught with your pants down, not treating the resistant organism. And so I, I, my role in the hospital is antimicrobial stewardship, making sure that uh, antibiotics are being used in a prudent fashion, right dose, right selection of, of uh, antibiotic, right duration, right diagnosis. Um, and what I fight against sort of all day long is um, clinicians wanting to be sure that they don't get it wrong will use overly broad or very broad antibiotics so that they don't miss the organism. And yet what we need to do, and it's difficult, is we need to try to keep antibiotics as narrow as possible using statistics, sometimes missing the organism, but trying to mostly capture the organism that the patient is likely to have. So broad spectrum versus narrow spectrum. Broad spectrum covers a lot of organisms a lot of genus and species combinations, and even if, they're even if they happen to harbor resistance mechanisms, narrow spectrum means it might only cover the most likely organism that that patient has given their most likely site of infection. And every single time you prescribe an antibiotic, it's a balancing act. So I remember once going into the doctor, I had a, a horrible throat, throat and I, I thought, I, I must have a strep throat. I mean, I stuck my tongue out in the, in the mirror and looked awfully red. And I went into my doctor. I said, you know, Jack, I got a strep throat. And he says, well, what makes you think that? And I said, oh, I feel awful. So he, he in the office, he did a little swizzle with a stick 
and, and stuck it in a tube. And he said, go sit out in the office for 10 minutes. And 10 minutes later, he calls me back and he says, ah, it's a viral infection. Go home. I'm not going to give you any antibiotics. On the, um, you know, on the other side of the spectrum, you know, that's a good doctor. He knew that it was likely to be viral and didn't give you any antibiotic. On the other side of the spectrum are doctors that would say, okay, well, you could have a virus, you could have strep, or you could have something else. So instead of nothing or penicillin for strep, I'm going to give you a broad spectrum antibiotics like a Z pack um, that covers more things because I don't want to get it wrong and I don't want you to get sicker and I don't want you to come back. And what they, you know, the you know, physicians these days, prescribers often say, I'm going to do this just to be safe. And what they fail to realize is that giving overly broad antibiotics or giving antibiotics when they're not indicated isn't the safest option. And this is really a behavioral science thing. It's a psychology thing. What makes us prescribers say, the safe option is to give you too much treatment. The safe option is to give you something that I know is going to promote resistance. Why isn't the safe option to give you nothing and see how you do for a couple of days and have you call if you're not well? Well, let's come back to some of these very practical grassroots, down-home ways to, to approach antibiotic resistance. But uh, Thomas Loff, can you tell me a bit about the, uh, briefly, it was a, a large study published in The Lancet, The Global Burden of, of Antimicrobial Resistance, studies done around the world. Tell me about this study and, and, and w what the results were. I gather the highest burden is in of antimicrobial resistant infections or resistant infections are in West Sub-Saharan Africa. But tell me about this study briefly and what it found. Yeah, thank you, David, for highlighting this study uh, and this paper because it is uh, today the most comprehensive approach to assess the global burden of AMR. Before that, we had a frequently cited review on antimicrobial resistance, also known as the O'Neill paper from the United Kingdom, that estimated that by 2050, we will have uh, the loss of 10 million lives per year due to AMR. But the paper was heavily criticized. It was not a primary analysis. It was not peer review, and many wondered whether, whether uh, the threat here was overestimated. But then uh, the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, since they're uh, invested in the global burden of disease study, understood that the full picture of the global burden of disease cannot be painted without the insights into the AMR problem. And this is why this huge collaboration with the University of Oxford and many other partners started. And when the paper was published, and even before that, when we had the results, even then everyone were astonished that the estimations revealed that almost 5 million people who died in 2019 had some drug-resistant bacteria and that AMR directly caused uh, one point, approximately 1.3 million of those deaths, making it a leading cause on a global scale. And the magnitude of the problem was shown to be at least as large as some other major diseases, such as HIV and malaria, and potentially much larger, which means the figure that I mentioned from O'Neill, we are much closer to that figure than we previously thought, and that over a million people per year are already dying due to infections such as lower respiratory, bloodstream, and intra-abdominal infectious syndromes that are further complicated with the AMR. And Yeah, of course. So uh, first, I would like to emphasize that this study uh, estimated both pathogens and specific pathogen drug combinations. So when we look at the separate pathogens, six of them were each responsible for more than a quarter of a million deaths associated with AMR. And these were the Escherichia or E. coli, Staphylococcus aureus, uh, Klebsiella pneumonia, uh, Streptococcus pneumonia or Strep pneumo, Acinetobacter baumannii, and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And on the seventh place, uh, 
it's also uh, 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 good to emphasize it was a mycobacterium tuberculosis, the causative agent of tuberculosis. And uh, within this pathogen, of course, some pathogen drug combinations are very pervasive, like you said, MRSA, and this is methicillin resistant Staph aureus. Or for so example, Staphylococcus, Staphylococcus aureus, it's resistant specifically to methicillin. Yeah, and by that we mean also then that this resistance is uh, th these strains are resistant to many beta lactam antibiotics. So some of these beta lactam antibiotics were the first one to be introduced into the clinical practice historically, and now we see that we are losing the battle here, and that many pathogens are resistant to them now. And also these are the, pe the penicillins. Yes, yes, yes. And this study showed, for example, even E. coli is very resistant to amino penicillins. The high burden of that which is also a similar, uh, the, the same group. So we see we, we, we lose a lot of antibiotics here, and this study has, has shown that. And on top of that, what's important to emphasize is that out of these seven deadliest bacteria that I have mentioned, vaccines are currently available for only two of them, for Streptococcus pneumonia and for mycobacterium tuberculosis. Of course, there are some vaccine in development, and there is a problem because some of these bacteria can be a normal flora like part of our microbiomes. So it's, it's, it's sometimes cumbersome to develop vaccines against them. But uh, yeah, we, we have to be cognizant. These are huge numbers. And now we see the threat is real. The, the pandemic is not silent anymore. It has a true voice. And, and where's, the, where's the burden the greatest? Where in the world are, are people most uh, dying the most from these uh, drug-resistant infections? Yeah, so it was really sobering to see that the, the Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia face the highest burden of AMR. And also one of the most worrying signs was that AMR disproportionately affects young children. So in 2019, one in five deaths attributable to AMR occurred in children under the age of five, especially in these regions. So uh, this is very problematic. We also found very high AMR burden in Eastern Europe and South Southern Latin America regions. And maybe on the first glance, it seems contraintuitive. We would expect that when you have a high antibiotic consumption in high resource settings, the burden would be disproportionately higher in these settings. But as mentioned, uh, the rates are highest in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. So we here have to observe the, 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 the bacterial AMR burden as a function of both prevalence of resistance and the underlying frequency of these critical infectious syndromes in these regions. In other words, it's very uh, there are very, very high rates of infection in these regions. So, of course, high rates of AMR will also be a problem in these regions. And of course, So in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, you get uh, lots of people getting infected with all sorts of things, respiratory infections, gut infections. There's a larger total number of infections. And so although antibiotic use is less, you're going to get a higher absolute number of drug-resistant infections. Yeah, that, that's exactly it. And uh, although also the fraction of the resistant infection is also high in these regions, so, and they, they further complicate the clinical course of, of the infected individuals. So this, this is a problem that will have to be addressed definitely in the future. Uh, Shira Daron, you, you, you've written with a pair of colleagues Quote, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has revealed the deadly impacts of structural racism and systemic health inequalities on, on racial uh, and ethnic minorities in the USA. Uh, can you uh, super quickly elaborate on this vis-a-vis -vis COVID, but then make the leap to, to drug-resistant bacterial infections? That th these infections, I mean, COVID neither COVID nor drug-resistant bacterial infections are um, uh, affecting populations in the United States uh, equally, that, that Black and Latino and Latinx populations are the most, seem to be the most susceptible. Talk about this if you can. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it didn't take long uh, for us to figure out that something was happening here with COVID and inequality. Uh, I don't think we really expected it. Um, you know, right from the beginning, we were seeing that black people were dying at over two times the rate of white people um, and that Latinx people, they couldn't stay home. 
for the for the most part uh, at, at high, it, they were working outside the home in essential jobs uh, that can't be done from their laptop at a greater rate than white people and and they lived in certain communities where cases of virus were just exploding um, and so we we started to think you know we work in, on AMR and um, that is the next pandemic and and that is also killing people at a high rate and yet although there are geographic differences in AMR that we just spoke about and in morbidity and mortality due to AMR what about when you're talking about our country uh, our wealthy country for the most part one sort of geographic area that has minoritized individuals within it could it be that like COVID-19 we have disparities in terms of rates of AMR and in terms of the impact of AMR. And so we wrote this paper really as a call to action. And what we, we did is we came up with uh, essentially eight reasons why we thought it was entirely possible for AMR to have issues of inequity related to racial and ethnic minoritization of certain groups. Um, and I can list what those are real quickly. Please so, do. Living in crowded or multi-generational homes. That was a huge driver of COVID-19 morbidity and mortality. Um, and and stands to reason could also be a driver of spread of AMR. Um, differences in non-prescribed antibiotic use. And this is particularly in our minority populations um, that where they or their parents or their grandparents come from other countries where it is common to take antibiotics without a prescription. Um, differences in socioeconomic status, we certainly know just in general, drive a lot of differences in health outcomes. Foreign travel to regions with high burden of resistant infections, again, um, amongst our minority populations that are minorities because they come from other parts of the world. Differences in health literacy, which are really um, enormous between different races and ethnicities and how that affects um, their understanding of antibiotic resistance and therefore how they access and utilize the healthcare system, barriers to accessing medical care, um, and differences in prescribed antibiotic use, namely how the prescriber views the patient and how they view different patients differently um, and how that might impact how likely they are to give that person antibiotics since we spoke about the fact that some people who don't need them actually get prescribed them. And then lastly, employment in food animal production or meat processing, which we actually know to be sort of hotbeds of antibiotic resistance because of what we talked about, antibiotics being used very extensively in food animal production. And uh, I, I read in your, uh, in your letter to, uh, to, to Nature Medicine that uh, a community spread, antibiotic resistant infections, it spread through the community as opposed to in hospital are, are higher within a black and Latino and Latinx populations? Well, certainly when there's more crowding, there's more spread. Um, and, and so, you know, really what, what this particular paper did um, was just lay out the potential reasons uh, why there may be a difference. And it is a roadmap for further research. And, and certainly my group is embarking on some of that research now. So for example, um, we are doing a scoping review and ultimately a systematic review to try to characterize all of the differences in AMR uh, that may have been uh, found and published in the literature. But we are also looking at, um, across our healthcare system, positive urine cultures. Um, and is the, uh, are patients with antibiotic resistant bacteria in positive urine cultures more or less likely to be of a racial minority and ethnic minority, live in certain um, zip codes associated with higher and lower socioeconomic status. Um, we can do some, um, some comparisons between those zip codes and certain job types, et cetera. So um, we, this, we're really just scratching the surface here um, in terms of what may be the truth. And it, it really has barely been studied to date. And this is a point that you raise in your in your letter that uh, you're you're trailblazing in this area. There's been very very little published in the medical literature about the the disproportionate prevalence of 
antimicrobial resistant infections and COVID infection, I guess, in, in, uh, in marginalized populations. Why is this? Why is there so little published in the literature about this? You know, I think that we weren't thinking about it, you know, uh, uh, it, it was, like I said, it was surprising to me that COVID was, um, COVID outcomes were so different. Um, and then it was really just a light bulb that went off to, to try to apply those same concepts to AMR. And I think that we are going to need to apply that same lens to many public health problems. Um, you know, some of the things that I mentioned that could could be drivers um, of uh, different you know differences, inequities in antimicrobial resistance. We know that there are differences. So, you know, employment and food animal production. We know that um, those people are more likely to be from the Latinx community. Um, differences in how prescribers view patients and treat patients by race. There's plenty of literature saying that there are differences, um, but no one's taken it to that next level to see if that affects AMR. So um, there's just a lot of um, a lot of opportunity here for future study. So uh, this is, kind of brings me to my last question: Is you know what do we need to do to tackle this global infectious crisis is a huge question. I guess we've got to do everything. Um, we, we've got to pull all the levers, but perhaps a good place to start is to try to, to reduce social inequities. And by reducing social inequities in the United States and North America and globally, that we can actually reduce the burden of uh, this crisis and not just vis-a-vis -vis, uh, you know, bacterial resistant drug infections, but just boosting health, just generally speaking, by eliminating social and economic disparities. Thoughts on that? Yeah, definitely. I completely uh, reflect everything that Shira has said. I'm also aware that even CDC now has a nice programs in place to tackle health equity issues across antibiotic resistant threats. For example, they have the project First Line to address training gaps. They have antibiotic resistance laboratory network to analyze patient demographic data alongside laboratory test results in order to give a full picture uh, and also some other programs. And this is important. Even in the global burden of antimicrobial resistance study, uh, what is the problem are these patient level data that link antimicrobial resistance to patient outcomes. And I will be the first proponent to uh, to, 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 to try to implement also these important socio-demographic factors also to be analyzed. And in our new uh, cross-country analysis studies that we are pursuing now, we also are looking uh, uh, at AMR in the, const in the context of, uh, for example, socio-developmental index and some other important factors to see how the countries differ here, which uh, in a way will be a, a way forward on how to approach this issue, this issue from this perspective as well. Shira, final thought on this? Yeah, I 100% agree. We need to tackle this problem at its root. Um, we need to work on uh, the social inequity problem. Um, I, I, I think that uh, here in the United States, we have an opportunity to try to improve access to healthcare, regular preventative healthcare, um, Everyone should have a primary care doctor, and they don't, and that is not distributed equitably. Those primary care providers should be properly educated, both in issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, and in issues of AMR and how to prevent um, AMR and how to use antibiotics prudently. Um, there, there are many things that we can do here uh, that would have an impact, and, and we just, just need to start tackling it. Because it's a, it's a frightening prospect, like going back to where I began. Um, you know, we, we kind of take for granted one of the benchmarks of global development in the, in the 21st century is, is great accomplishment of having reduced the, you know, the global burden of infectious disease. And people don't die of infectious diseases anymore in, in the so-called developed world. They die of lifestyle diseases, heart attacks and atherosclerosis and all those kinds of cancers, but they don't die of pre preventable infectious diseases anymore. Of course, they we know they do, 
um, you know, approaching now surpassing a million deaths from COVID. Um, but we've kind of taken this for granted that we beat infectious disease. And with the, the advent of, uh, you know, drug resistant infections, we're kind of this, this new, new era is looming where we're going back to a period where a, a simple infection turns out to be fatal. You get a little nick while you're shaving yourself if you're a man or, you know, some, some other trivial injury and you get infected with a, a drug resistant bacterium and um, you end up dying. We call that the post antibiotic era. Um, so, you know, the extreme is a simple scratch could kill you. Um, but imagine that we were in an era where performing surgery was too dangerous because we can't prevent a post-operative infection or doing a transplant or giving somebody chemotherapy is too dangerous because those things suppress the immune system and allow infection. And we don't have antibiotics to treat those infections. You know, we would, would really have reversed so many decades of medical progress if we get to a post-antibiotic era. Thomas Love, final thought? Yeah, I agree completely. And I think from my perspective, this is important to emphasize that we need to continue with this stringent surveillance and monitoring the global burden of disease, at the same time addressing this intertwined nature of AMR. This means encompassing AMR in human health, animal health, in the environment, within the framework of, of One Health. And this also means multi-sectoral partnerships between the research community and other experts, many experts like physicians, pharmacists, public and global health experts, veterinary specialists. And, and, and global actions should consolidate access to effective antimicrobials with infection prevention strategies, with a, a, a responsible use of existing antimicrobials, and uh, yeah, bridge all the domains that I have mentioned to in this One Health approach to this important issue. Shira Daron is an associate professor of medicine at Tufts University in Boston and the director of the Antimicrobial Stewardship Program at Tufts Medical Center. She co-authored a letter to the journal Nature Medicine entitled Antibiotic Resistance, a Call to Action to Prevent uh, the Next Epidemic of Inequality. We'll link to that letter at the Real News website. Tomislav Mestrovich is a medical doctor and clinical microbiologist and associate professor at University North in Croatia. He's also a scholar at the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington. We'll also link to that Lancet study that uh, um, Thomas Loff has helped to promote and is helping to promote about the global burden of drug-resistant infection. Before you go, please don't forget to subscribe to The Real News YouTube channel and head on over to therealnews.com support um, to become, I should say, therealnews.com slash support to become a monthly Real News sustainer. Your contributions help we keep, help ensure we keep bringing you important coverage and conversations like this one. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye for now.